It's like watching all your favourite movies play out in front of you. They look like the products of a fevered mind, a megalomaniac bent on destruction perhaps. But these science fiction style visions have a bolder purpose. They're the big science solutions to save the world from climate change. Environmental groups dismiss these projects as pie-in-the-sky plans, an expensive distraction from persuading people to cut their emissions and tackle climate change that way. What's more, most have no money or political capital behind them. Yet two of these plans are different. They aim not just to stave off climate change, but to put it into reverse by sucking carbon out of the Earth's atmosphere. And the people behind them say the human race has no choice. Time is running out. The alternative is just to let the CO2 build up and, and reap the consequences, and I don't think we're going to like it. We can't answer the question of whether this works or it doesn't work, and we can't answer the question about the impact of it unless we do experiments. They both think the world is locked into putting more carbon into the atmosphere, while rich countries like America can afford to switch to renewables. The developing world can grow only on the back of fossil fuels. I went across the Atlantic to meet the president who hopes to influence the future of the world's energy. I met him at his official residence, the White House, in Iceland. We met before their current financial troubles. What we have got out of it here in Iceland is transforming an economy which in my youth was over 80% dependent on oil. And now 100% of our electricity is from clean energy resources and over 80% uh, of our total energy needs, including cars and shipping, is from clean energy resources. Iceland already has a history of clean power, but now they want to move beyond that. The president is promoting one of the schemes aimed at sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. He was inspired when he heard Wallace Broker, one of the first scientists to warn about climate change. The world demands energy. The developing nations are going to demand energy. And that energy, since it's now 85% fossil fuel, to think that it's going to go to zero fossil fuel is madness. He has a plan to bury carbon dioxide, and Iceland is uniquely placed to help. Perched on the top of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, this volcanic island is made out of basalt rock, the perfect place to get rid of CO2. So how is this basalt rock crucial to this whole process of burying the CO2? What we're going to do, we're going to take CO2 from a power plant, dissolve it in water, and then inject it into the rocks. And what the CO2 charged water is going to do is going to leach elements out of the rocks and bind with the calcium, with the carbonate in the water and form a solid calcium carbonate. And the beauty of that being that it's so stable, is that right? Yeah, this calcium carbonate will then be stable for 100,000 and perhaps millions of years. And as a volcanic island, it's a test site with an added bonus, providing one of the key ingredients for the Wallace Broker experiment. This is the sound of some 150 megawatts of raw power. It's Iceland's newest and biggest geothermal plant, and they're testing to see just how powerful it is. This giant borehole drilled more than a kilometre into the volcanic rock releases steam at 300 degrees C, along with the rotten egg smell of hydrogen sulphide and trace amounts of carbon dioxide, which the scientists can use in their carbon capture experiment. Frida is the project's manager. 
She took me for a drive in her ultra green hydrogen hybrid car to show me where they're testing the flow of water through one section of lava. All this area over there it will be our injection and monitoring site and we are going to, to fix the CO2 in, at 400 to 800 meters depth under this lava field. So you're trying to find out what might happen to the carbon dioxide once you've injected into the site? Yes, because we need to be uh, assured that uh, this uh, bedrock is suitable for the injection of the CO2. So the engineers here might have a way to get rid of carbon dioxide, but we still need to capture it from the Earth's atmosphere. Surprisingly, that could prove to be the easy part. After all, the basic science is well understood. Carbon scrubbers have been used for decades in deep sea diving, space stations and submarines, which all need to remove carbon dioxide from their air supplies so that people don't suffocate. That might be OK on a small scale, but to make this work globally, he needs a bigger device. He says each must be capable of absorbing the CO2 emitted by thousands of cars. Iceland is famous for its rugged scenery. So what might people around here think if something like this were placed in the middle of it? They call it an artificial tree because it's designed to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. But to have any impact, they're going to need millions of these dotted across the landscape. But there's more than one way to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Artificial trees just do what plants do naturally. And you don't have to do all this on land. Other investors are turning not to plants or trees, but algae. Algae are the most abundant form of life in the oceans and dramatically these tiny organisms are responsible for half of the natural carbon fixing that takes place on Earth. In an unfashionable suburb of San Francisco, the American government has poured two million dollars into this former ice cream factory. And that's nothing compared to the $43 million that's come from commercial investors. Here, they're making fuel from algae. OK, so what have we got here then? So uh, here we have um, barrels of oil made from algae that we are uh, turning into uh, diesel fuel, jet fuel, plastics, um, pretty much anything, uh, anything you can make from oil we're making using this material. One of the advantages of algal oil production is that you can make it where you like. And this has already attracted the attention of politicians looking for energy security in the decades ahead. Are you talking to any governments? Uh, we're, talking to, uh, we're talking to some governments uh, about this, and that's really about energy security. Can you tell me who? Uh, I'm afraid I can't. The company grows large amounts of algae in vats and genetically engineers them to thrive on wood. They claim the whole process is carbon neutral. In our process, carbon dioxide is sequestered out of the air by a plant, and then we take that sequestered carbon, feed it to the algae, and then we burn the fuel, which results in carbon dioxide going back into the atmosphere. So it's a loop, and that's very different from oil crude oil, petroleum, coming straight out of the ground where we're actually adding carbon to the, uh, to the atmosphere. And there are companies who want to go even further with algae, using it to capture carbon and keep it out of the atmosphere. Margaret Leinen is from a company called Climos, which is raising money so scientists can experiment with fertilizing the world's seas with extra iron to encourage more algae or phytoplankton to grow. The scientific community has told us that their smaller scale experiments all show that ocean iron fertilization stimulates the, growth, the productivity of the oceans. The question is whether you can use that to draw that 
organic carbon, that CO2, down into the deep ocean and get it away from the atmosphere. And that's what has to be tested. The green critics in the back rows still see these schemes as a dangerous distraction. They say scientists, disillusioned with our collective inability to cut emissions, are pressing the panic button. Wallace Broker's a highly respected scientist, but it seems to us like he's starting to panic. But you can understand why he's starting to panic, because the speed of response in, and the scale of the threat is now pretty scary. Now, his idea that he's pushing may well work, but we're very wary of large-scale interventions in ocean ecosystems that we really don't understand in the hope that this will tackle climate change. The bigger frustration is that this stuff is a distraction. It's an expression of political despair compared to what we know we can do already. What's not yet clear is whether history will see the scientists pushing these schemes as superheroes or supervillains.